Uh, I've known about this engagement for two months, at least, and have been very uh, enthused about the fact that I will get to talk about my field, my ex field of expertise, quote, quote, uh, to the group of people that I feel that it's the most important for them to hear. Uh, I feel a little strange here hanging all over me, but one of the things I didn't get done was to get a good uh, system so that I could record what I'm doing. <coughs> uh, at 3 o'clock this morning, I was uh, trying to get a very sick person home and in bed, so I'm a little punchy and I'm going to have to settle down a little bit, and I hope that this will happen in the first few minutes. I want to talk to you this morning about what is essentially the number one health problem that we've got in the United States, and probably in the Western world, and probably Eastern Europe too. It's not the number one killer. The number one killer is heart disease followed by, I believe, cancer, followed by victims of chemical dependency, a term you may not be familiar with, but I hope you will before the day is over. But in thinking about how I wanted to present a day-long seminar, uh, that's a lot of talking and a lot of material, uh, I went over this thing in my head and I blocked out my approach and uh, then I went off to school for a while, and then I came back, and I did some more work on it. Uh, and I worked so hard on it that a week ago, I still didn't have in my mind exactly how I wanted to approach it. And I was telling Al, I was reminded of a man that I used to know when I was in the Army. I spent 23 years as a soldier, who uh, was an ordnance expert. Uh, he really knew about... Uh, weapons and uh, things like trajectories and, uh, and, and the like. And he was also an MIT graduate, brilliant man, mathematician. And we were sitting back in my days when I did such things, we were sitting in a bar. Uh, and he began to tell me about uh, an experience that he'd had while hunting in the far west. And this man was an outdoorsman. He was sort of one of these survival people that didn't like to sleep in his uh, Winnebago, but would put his rucksack on and a blanket roll and go out and rough it for a while. And uh, he said, Joe, I'd been out two weeks in the, in the high Rockies. And he said, you know, I just carry a knife and a few emergency rations, and I live off the land. He said, I've been walking for two weeks back in there. And he said, I was coming toward the end of my of my leave and I had to get back, had about 20 miles to walk so I'd get back to my jeep and he said I was coming along with one round of ammunition left and I, and I, and I passed a dog leg canyon and just way back in there I could see just the snout of a bear and he said I froze, I froze. And I looked up to assess where I was and what the situation was and he said there was a sheer granite wall 400 meters high and 600 meters long. The you know, wind was coming from my back. I knew I didn't have a prayer of approaching that bear any closer than I was because the wind would come off, bounce off the wall, and he'd, she would smell me and either attack or run. And I said, what do you mean she? Well, he said, I could tell from the shape of the snout that it was a female there. So he said, I very quickly decided that what I was going to have to do in order to hit that bear was to pick the exact spot on that sheer granite wall, 2,400 square meters, that the two millimeter nose of my bullet was going to have to hit in order to ricochet and go into the bear. He said, you know, I, I, mathematics is, is my field in, in, in the ordnance core, and I knew that this was one of those problems I love to get my teeth into. Had all this trigonometry and, uh, and the like, and he said, Remember, Joe, all this is going through my head very rapidly. He said, the first thing I did was determine from my remembrance of my study of geology exactly how hard granite was on Mohs scale of hardness. 
I cranked that into the equation. He said, you know, what I needed to do was get the elevation and the windage on my sight and determine where I was going to fire that bullet. He said, uh, I knew how much my bullet weighed. And he said, I knew that it was a steel, copper clad steel jacket bullet and it had a hardness of four on most scale of hardness. And I cranked that in four against nine on the, on the scale. He said, the wind was coming from my rear, from my rear end at four knots, hitting the wall and accelerating as a result thereof. And I figured out what the acceleration rate was, cranked that into the equation. He said it was, uh, uh, we were 6,215 feet above sea level, and that meant that the air was thinner. And I knew how much thinner it was per 100 feet above sea level. It meant the bullet was going to travel faster, so I cranked that into the equation. <laughs> I looked up, the sun was exactly 17 and one half degrees beyond the perpendicular, which meant my sight picture was a little bit different than it would have been if it had been high noon. I cranked that into the equation. He said it was a female bear. That meant she had more fat. Fat is denser in terms of, <laughs> of, the, of the, uh, uh, the impact of the bullet, so I cranked that into the equation. She'd been eating berries. After all, it was the fall. She was fixing to hibernate. That meant that the density of the fat was somewhat different than if she had been eating fish. Crank that into the equation. <laughs> he said, I began to figure all that up, and I said, he said, Joe, I eased my pack off. He said, it always took about a 60 seconds. Remember, Joe, math's my field. So I eased the pack on the ground, slipped my rifle off, very quietly slipped down, took the safety off, took a deep breath, let half of it out, Figured out where I was going to put that shot. Began to squeeze up on the slack of the trigger. Fired off the round. Then so happened he picked up his beer and went on like he you know, began talking about something else. And I said, hey, John, what? What happened? What do you mean, what happened? When you fired the bullet, oh, he said, I missed the wall. <laughs> Shaggy dog stories are terrible. <laughs> so at 3 o'clock this morning, when I'm trying to get this person uh, out of trouble, I was thinking, I wonder really how I'm going to do this today. And I almost missed the wall. I'm going to cover today, and we've got a handout that at our first break we can, uh, you can pick up one of. I'm going to talk about chemical dependency. And I said this is a term you may not be familiar with. What we have come to learn in the last 10 to 15 years when progress has really been made in the treatment and recovery of what used to be called alcoholics and drug addicts is that the elements of drug addiction and alcoholism are identical. I mean, there really isn't any difference in what one's drug of choice might happen to be. Now the chemically dependent person will make much about the fact that I've never used any of them drugs, or I don't drink hard liquor, only beer, or I've never had anything a doctor didn't give me. Because one of the defenses that I use is to rationalize and minimize what's been going on with me. But essentially, it's all one disease and we call it chemical dependency. You can call it substance abuse if you want to. But that always puts me off a little bit when someone talks about drug abuse because I see them standing around stomping on pills or doing something like that. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me. It's chemical dependency. So I'm going to describe to you what the disease is, how it develops, and how we recover from it in sort of a broad overview. And then I'm going to talk about something that every chemical dependent person has, an enabler who later becomes a codependent. I'm going to talk to you about the chemically dependent family, the process we call intervention, treatment, recovery. I'm going to talk about the Alcoholics Anonymous Fellowship. And then I'm going to talk to you about the pastor's role in the whole business of chemical dependency because, believe me, you are keys to recovery. 
chemical dependency has been described in many of the ways that we describe it as a disease of spiritual bankruptcy. And it really is. And you'll see how later. I said that this is the number one health problem that we have, and I can back that up with figures, and I'm going to bore you just for a moment with a few statistics. The best estimates we have from the federal government right now is that we have 15 to 18 million alcoholics alone in this country today, right now, in being. We've got an, an estimated 5 to 8 million people that are on street drugs. We have absolutely no idea of how many people that are now addicted or approaching addiction in prescription drugs. But the figure is bound to be large. Now, in addition to this, each chemically dependent person emotionally and seriously wounds three to five other people. Three to five other people. He wounds them or, uh, to the point that they desperately need therapy and a recovery program themselves. Generally, this is his family, but not always. Usually, it's the family. Mothers, fathers, spouses, children, brothers, sisters, the like. And here's a dreadful statistic. Of the children of one chemically dependent parent, 50% themselves become chemically dependent. 50% of them. If they're two chemically dependent <coughs> parents, the chances shoot up to 80% of those children themselves become chemically dependent. If they ever use any drug that affects the central nervous system. This is called a three-generation disease because when we do intakes on patients, we find invariably and inevitably at least three generations of people that this thing has trickled down through. There is strong evidence to suggest that there's a genetic factor involved. One study involving 30 years uh, done in Sweden having to do with foundlings or orphans that were from alcoholic parents that were adopted by roughly two groups of parents or foster or parents, half of which were chemically dependent or involved in chemicals and half weren't. Half were more or less teetotalers. At the end of this 30 years, when they did a survey of these now grown orphan children, they found there was absolutely no difference in the number of people that were addicted in either group, which would suggest, and there was a high rate incidentally, which would suggest that the environment didn't have as much to do with it as the genetic factor. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry to no problem. Duke University is doing some very interesting studies that would seem to suggest that persons who become addicted to a central nervous system drug have a different chemical makeup, biochemical makeup in their bodies. They're somehow different. Yes, sir. You say the environment did not have as much to do with No, I don't say that it didn't have as much, but it certainly is not the only factor. Um, here's, the, here's the bottom line on people who use any type of chemical that affects the central nervous system. If they, it's used on a regular basis, one of ten will become addicted. It goes right across the board, and it doesn't really matter what the drug is. Here's a very interesting thing that we've learned in the last few years in studying a large number of chemically dependent people. If we take this, and this is not a, a real accurate bell curve in as much as 67% of the population doesn't exist in here, but a significant number of people in the United States of America 
live in more or less constant emotional pain. You know, it, it, they're, the way they're raised, what they're doing, the way they cope with life, they just seem to live in emotional pain. The large majority of people more or less cope with what's happening in life. You know, they have stress situations and, and it might cause them to go down if they come back up. And a smaller number of people than, the, than this in here, but still a significant, statistically significant number of people seem to live in some sort of state of euphoria. Every single thing they've done all their lives seems to click. And you've seen these people. I mean, they're the ones that just make all the grades. They get the, the, the best looking girl or the best looking young man and all the promise when they're in school. They're elected class president in college and they go right out and they just click it all of their lives. Now, you would think that of people, persons that become addicted, this would be the highest group followed by this group or followed by this group. And let me tell you something. Of the people that use chemicals in all of these three groups, there's absolutely no difference in the number that become addicted. One in ten, statistically, becomes hooked. One in ten. I think that's something that we should bear in mind when we think about who it is in our flock or in the general population or what have you that's this drunk or junkie. Who is this person? Can we excuse him on the grounds of the fact that he was raised in a wretched, disadvantaged area or what have you? The simple fact of the matter is that if you go to an AA meeting, what will astound you is not the Bowery bums that are there, but the talent that's there. It's absolutely incredible. We don't know the exact dollar amount, but the best estimate that we got from the government is that it cost us 18 to 20 billion dollars a year in lost productive cost. And when you crank in uh, the medical aspects of the disease, it, it rises un undoubtedly much more dramatically. One person that I know that's, uh, that's very big in uh, employee assistance programs, this is where you go out and set up programs to help people who are addicted, said that he didn't have much trouble in determining in uh, a plant who was probably hooked. All he had to do was go in and pick up the medical records and drop them if it made a loud whoop. This probably person was probably, you know, having problem with chemicals because in addition to everything else that happens to me if I'm on a chemical, I begin to have a lot of physical problems with it too. Okay, those are some statistical aspects uh, of what the disease is about. Now, what we've come to learn is that this is a three-part disease. It's a spiritual disease. Come in. Grab a cup of coffee and uh, make yourself to home. It's a spiritual disease. It's an emotional disease. And finally, it becomes a physical disease. And that's roughly the way we get sick. Spiritually, emotionally, physically. Now, despite a lot of movies that we see and, 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 and the like and what we might have read, one of the simplest aspects of chemical dependency is the physical addiction per se. You know, we say, oh my gosh, this guy's mainline in heroin now. He's lost forever. Nobody can get off that stuff. Not so. It takes about five to ten days to clear the body of heroin, and that person is no longer physically addicted. That's all. In fact, coming down from uh, a serious bout with alcohol is, is much more dangerous and takes a longer period of time. Each drug seems to have its uh, detoxifying period you know, that we have to deal with, but uh, physical addiction is not the biggie because that person who's been cleared of heroin in five to ten days of detoxification, if you put him back out on the street, very quickly he'll be back on it. So during the day, I'll from time to time speak about 
alcoholics and drunks and junkies and potheads and field heads and all these things. And those street jargon terms pop into my vocabulary because that's what I deal with all the day. And that's what people that are on these things call themselves once they get through their denial. It is, however, chemical dependency. That gets to be a mouthful after a while, so drunk jumps out or the like. Okay. We have essentially three major types of drugs that we get addicted to. The first and most common is our old friend alcohol. Beer, wines, whiskeys, liqueurs. Alcohol is the base for most and preservative for most liquid medications. It's in scope. It's in uh, vanilla flavoring, and all flavorings is a preservative. Shaving lotions and the like. And people can and do drink all these things. I knew a lady that was in treatment one time, and they very, made a very bad mistake. When you go in one of these treatment centers, they shake you down. I mean, they shake you down. Because they've learned that people come in prepared for the siege. <laughs> <laughs> one lady, when I was working in a chemical dependency unit, came in with very neatly sewn down one of her seams uh, a 28 day supply of Valium. So she'd been shaken down, and they take things like mouthwash. Everybody brings a lot of mouthwash. And they lock all this stuff up. And they made a mistake of leaving this up open. And she got in, and she said, Joe, I drank every bit of mouthwash. And I found one thing. I like scope much better than I did micron. So she'd, been, <laughs> she'd, you know, she'd really gotten down to where she had a, a preference. Uh, now, you know, if we are raised in the South, I was raised in the South. Uh, my sister says, we weren't raised in the Bible Belt, Joe. We were raised on the buckle of the Bible <laughs> Belt. And uh, there, was no, there was no alcohol in my home. Uh, if, if we were riding down a street in Birmingham, Alabama, and we came to a Huda Pole beer uh, sign there, my father would go on for five minutes about how, you know, that was the devil's handmaid. You know, just, you couldn't drink and be a Christian, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But you may remember back, oh, right after World War II, there was a senator from, a state senator down in Louisiana that developed a tonic. And it had a lot of vitamins and minerals. <laughs> yeah, it also had 25% uh, alcohol, it was 50 proof, you know. And that man made a fortune on that stuff. All the people like my mother, God bless her, uh, who would never touch alcohol, found that something happened when they took this great little tonic. Had a call. Had a call. You got it. Had a call. Uh, so, you know, the obvious uh, fact is that people, be, you know, drink alcohol. And, and you know, I, I've, I've mused a lot of times about who the first drunk was. He probably was some caveman running from a Tynosaurus Rex, and he dove into a, uh, a big bush full of berries had been hanging there and fermenting on the vine. He ate a few of those suckers, and all of a sudden things happened. He wasn't afraid of Cyrosaurus Rex anymore, you know. It probably goes back that far. Certainly it's mentioned in the Bible and all of our recorded history. And the effects that it might have one upon one's perceptions. I'm not here to talk about the rightness and wrongness of any drug, and I've got to tell you that. And I'm not ta talking to you about whether one drug leads to another. Uh, that really is absolutely irrelevant, uh, as you'll see later. The next major groups of drugs that we hear the most about are street drugs. Street drugs. Uh, the one that has the, bad, the worst press, the problem is heroin, uh, followed closely by marijuana. And uh, those are just uh, a couple, because believe me, if it's uh, a drug that will affect whether I'm up or down or what have you, sold on the street. Uh, uh, the next, uh, the, the, the glamour drug right now is cocaine. Uh, it uh, is supposedly uh, very safe. You can snort a little this, this, this and all, and you just are, you know, way out there uh, having a good time. Uh, and, and I suppose that uh, some people may think that it's safe. I know that if you use much of it, it'll cause a septum between your nostrils to go away, but uh, uh, 
I have a very good friend that's uh, a doctor uh, who's just in the last couple of years gotten his license back, and this was his drug of choice, Demerol and cocaine. And he said, you know, I, I mainline the stuff, Joe. And he said, I was sitting with two other doctors. We were both junkies uh, when my heart stopped. He said, the only reason why I'm alive is I was with two doctors, and they weren't as blown away as I was, and they did CPR on me, and I, you know, I'm alive now. So, you know, there are no non-dangerous drugs, let me tell you, period. Uh, all of the opium derivatives, of which heroin is one, but uh, uh, drugs like belladonna, are still, or you can still buy. Beautiful lady, I think she what that means. Uh, morphine, codeine, uh, and all of the synthetics, uh, such as uh, Demerol and the like. In addition, there's a very deadly drug called PCP, or angel dust, which is, uh, originally was an animal tranquilizer, and it was so dangerous that wouldn't, they, they can't even use it with animals now. Uh, LSD, the amphetamines, which are, uh, which, which are on the street are called speed. They perk you up, or the quaaludes, which take you down. And the like. And some of these, of course, have very, very legitimate medical uses. There isn't any medical use for heroin because we've got uh, it purified out into morphine and some of the other things. But street drugs are the ones that get all of our news and our publicity. And it is certainly a problem, no question about it. Not only has it introduced uh, a new element to our, quote, rebellious youth, you know, it was an area where they could be different. But it's also uh, produced an awful lot more uh, uh, in terms of an economic base for our crime element in the United States, be that as it may. And finally, the major group that people become addicted to are prescription drugs. Prescription drugs. The most prescribed drug in the Western world is the little minor tranquilizer, quote, quote, underline, minor tranquilized Valium. And I know doctors that will tell you Valium's not addictive. Dr. Joe Purse has a good line about that. He says, most doctors think of alcoholism as a Valium deficiency. Valium deficiency, right. <laughs> Joe, Joe Purse has had a lot of quotes. Joe Purse is, uh, is uh, for those of you who don't know of this uh, very colorful figure, was the uh, director of Long Beach Naval Hospital, I believe, when Betty Ford and uh, uh, Jim, uh, Billy Carter went through there. He's now the medical director of a of an organization called CompCare, which has about 18, I believe, chemical dependency treatment centers, plus a lot of private psychiatric hospitals. But Joe Purse says, himself a psychiatrist, I believe, is he not? He says, sending an alcoholic to a psychiatrist is like sending a jellyfish to an orthopedic surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> Very colorful man. Uh, the, the obvious uh, drugs, if we think about chemical dependency, that we could uh, become addicted to are drugs that are, fit, that, are, that are given to us to do something to our perceptions. Uh, we give tranquilizers for anxiety, and we give mood elevators for depression, and, you know, and we give painkillers to do that. And, and it's pretty easy to see that, you know, if you use too many of these that you're probably going to get hooked. Certainly we know that uh, morphine addiction has been around for a long, long time. We're just coming to realize how addictive these mood elevators or anti-anxiety drugs are, uh, but, but they certainly are. But in addition to that, so help me, you can get addicted to anything that, that touches the central nervous system. I, uh, I have a friend that uh, that, like me, is bounced off the ground a lot from, from being not too agile and jumping out of a lot of airplanes. And when you have a bad, bad orthopedic problem and you go to a hospital or to a doctor, what he's going to prescribe as a standard regime is a drug called Parafon Forte. It's a muscle relaxer and, and a painkiller, usually Motrin or something like that. And nobody ever thinks of anybody being addicted to Parafon Forte, but you certainly can. And it's great stuff. You can go off and stay, stay for a while with that stuff. Uh, one of the most curious cases I've ever seen is a drug uh, that's given for diarrhea. Uh, and, and it's so 
was so lightly considered when we were in Vietnam that we used to carry them in our helmet band because everybody over there had could do the hundred yard dash and ate flat. You know? <laughs> and so we all we took a, the drug called Lamotil, which is essentially atropine sulfate. Now it's a powerful drug, all right. But nobody ever thinks of becoming addicted to anything like that. But I had a patient in a psychiatric hospital. That was his drug of choice. He took about 20 of those things a day. And, and for you or I to take that many, it would kill us. We wouldn't get more than six or seven of them down. That was his drug. That's all he'd ever taken. Uh, I think probably the worst withdrawal I ever saw was a lady who had been on nothing but Valium. But let me tell you where she was with her Valium. When she woke up in the morning, literally, to get out of bed, she took one. I mean, she couldn't face the coffee machine. If she went to the commissary, she had to take two before she left. And she said, Joe, when I get in there and I get through shopping, facing the checkout line was so anxiety producing for me, I had to go take another value. Because I wasn't sure I could get through the line and I wasn't sure, having gotten through there, that I could find my car. And I think about seven days or eight days after she was in the hospital, she went into a withdrawal crisis that had she not been under medical care, I think she probably would have died. So I'm a little less than tolerant when people tell me about how safe these minor tranquilizers are. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later, and I'll tell you uh, how dangerous they are in terms of me getting sober or off another drug, which is what caused Joe Purse to make his statement. Chemical dependency. I said that we, it's a three-part disease and that people get sick spiritually, emotionally, and physically. Uh, I was telling Al that uh, I got $1,000 worth of charts here. I went up 500 since I talked to him. And uh, I'm not sure that you can see them or that they'll even stay here. We'll give them a try. There are a lot of ways of, of looking at, at humans and the way we are. Uh, a friend of mine went to Harvard, uh, seminar at Harvard last year, uh, put on by the American Psychiatric Association, and the lead speaker said, ladies and gentlemen, our field, whether we're psychologists or psychiatrists, is not a science, it's an art. And I really believe that's probably true. So that the way we look at the human being can be approached in a lot of different ways. As pastors, you look at the human being in one way, and as doctors look at him from another way. I tend to be a little bit holistic in the way I look at humans. Uh, in any event, if we think of our feelings as going along a continuum from pain to normal to euphoria, and we keep that thought in mind as I talk about how this disease starts developing, It'll make a little sense, I think. The first time that we use a chemical, whether it's recreationally or as prescribed to us, particularly, let's take alcohol, because I happen to have a very close, long-term relationship with that drug, or I did. The first time one has a drink, how something happens. It's very powerful to us. It changes the way things are with us. And it's so powerful that we learn that it can give us a temporary mood swing. You know, if I'm shy, all of a sudden I'm not as shy anymore. I was blessed being born with two left feet, you know, and, but with a couple of drinks I could dance about anything, including going on the stage if I'd had enough. Uh, 
And we, and we learn as we use our chemical initially that every time you take it, that's what happens. It always creates a mood swing. And that little fact there, that it always works, is as deadly as it can be because you never get it out of one's mind. Every time I take a drug that alters my perception, it works. And if uh, not a lot of need in taking notes on the chart because that's in your handout. Uh, the remarks aren't too much, but the charts are. And also, I come to trust the fact that if I take two drinks or three drinks, thus and so will happen. I learn to trust the drug. That if I take X amount of this drug or I smoke one joint or I take one quaalude or whatever it is that I've learned always works and always produces a certain change, then I learn to trust that change. And I learned that it's so powerful that it's a little scary. And so I better set some rules on when I use it and how I use it. Now, what's happening there in this first learning of the mood swing is that when I take my drug, I go from normal up toward euphoria. And then after the drug leaves my body, I slip back down to normal again. This is a, a, a learning phase. Now, in this country, we certainly appear to think that we can live better chemically. And if you don't believe this, look at the advertising lines and what you see on TV. A, a goodly portion has to do with something that I take by mouth. You know, it may be a very innocuous drug for uh, stomach problems or what have you. Or it may be, you know, how groovy it is to be with a bunch of ex-athletes drinking light beer or what have you. And again, I'm not here to moralize. I'm just telling you that's the way it is in our society. We can live better chemically. Uh, that's the way we're, we're programmed. Now, in the second phase of the development of, of dependency, I've learned that this will happen, and then I go to seek this mood swing. At first, it's sort of an experimental thing, and I might, you know, play with a few things before I find that this is a drug that I like to take that will cause this to always happen. See? At this point, I'm learning to use the drug at appropriate times and places. Now, it's very important that we approach the use of chemicals, at, at this point anyway, in a, from a non-moralistic, non-judgmental, non, perhaps for some of you, uh, religious point of view. Otherwise, uh, we're, we're biased in the way we look at it before we start. The simple fact is, in our society, in most situations, socially, alcohol is permitted. Certainly in the life, in the, the social life that these gentlemen are in and that I was raised in as a soldier, it was always present at social events. Always. Always. And I use... I learned quickly that I got to use this thing right. Hey, I just can't get it blown away every time, or I, you know, I'm going to do something dumb. So I, I learned to use it at appropriate times and place. And I will put it's so powerful to me. And I, you know, I've gotten drunk a couple of times, and everybody does early on. You know? And and it was made me do silly things. And if I'm a young professional, or or I'm a student, or I'm on a job, or something like that. I set rules for myself. No drinking before 5 p.m. You know, the sun's got to drop below the yard arm. You know. Uh, or other 
rules that I have to govern this very powerful new thing that I've discovered. Now, if I overindulge, <laughs> I may suffer a lot from it, physically. I have a hangover. I have a hangover. Yes, sir. Let me, let me interrupt just one second. Uh, your comment just a minute ago, it is like the alcoholic saying, everybody drinks. You know, I don't really think, I know it's, it's a problem, but I don't think it's a, all that pervasive. I just can't imagine every family represented in uh, these churches that everybody drinks. I don't. I, I agree with you. Not everybody does. And I can't but but I would I would say that you know I don't want to get hung into one particular chemical because of those same people that wouldn't have alcohol in their family in their home. A great number of them have gone to their friendly physician because they've got a lot of problems and they're taking some drug to help them face life. And the same thing is happening. See, I just picked alcohol because it's easier to talk about. We're all familiar with it. Okay. Important, though, that we remember that it's not just booze and the booze battle we're talking about. We're talking about any chemical that will affect my central nervous system because the statistics are clear across the board nationwide. One person in ten that uses a chemical that affects my central nervous system will become addicted. So, you know, it's really a moot point when you get right down to it. Okay. So, you know, if I overindulge in my drug, then I'm going to go up to euphoria and I'm going to come back to normal, but I'm going to have a little physical pain. But when I'm talking about pain, normally euphoria, I'm not talking about physical pain. I'm talking about emotional pain, an emotional price. And at this point in the seeking the mood swing, when I slide into the social drinker or social user, I am not paying any emotional price for the use of my drug. If I drink too much, I might get a hangover. And social drinkers, you know, every now and again, decide that they will just get blown away. It's New Year's, or they're promoted, or it's a birthday, or something like that, so they overuse. You know, and they know it's gonna, they're gonna pay the price. And they get up and they do. They say, oh boy, that was rough. It was worth it, but it was rough. You know, we had a good time last night, didn't we? Yeah. At this point, the, the, the really important thing is that I hadn't paid any price for that use yet. Now, social users of drugs stay here. They, they always have these self-imposed rules for this powerful drug that always works. It always creates a mood swing, either down or up. You know, and that's where they stay. Now, in the third phase, these are going to fall. I know they are. They're going to just go shooting clear across the room, but I'm going to have faith right now. I'm reminded of the guy, one of my favorite cartoons, a man sitting with an apple on his head and an arrow right between his eyes. And the caption says, keep smiling, have faith. So maybe they won't fall. Now, in the, in the phase that we call moving into the harmful dependency stage, we go up to euphoria, but we drop down and we start paying an emotional price. Why do we pay an emotional price? Well, I begin to experience a periodic loss of control over the chemical, and I really can't predict what's going to happen when I use it. And we don't know really why that happens, you know, except one in ten people seem to react to it that way. I begin to lose periodic control, and as a result of that, and this is where we start seeing what happens in the spiritual aspects of the disease. When I start using my drug, and it starts affecting me so that I'm paying an emotional price, one of the reasons why I'm paying an emotional price is that when I use my drug, I start doing things that violate for me my system of values. Okay. Now, now, my values might be quite different from yours. I suspect they're probably pretty close since I seem to be surrounded by good, staunch Methodists, if nothing else. 
but regardless of whether I have any religious affiliation or not, or where I come from or anything else, I've got a system of values. Everybody does. Unless I'm a sociopathic personality, they don't have any values. And let me tell you an interesting thing that's been found out, or at least Vern Johnson, one of my favorite authors in this field, who writ, wrote a very fine book called I'll Quit Tomorrow. And if I could recommend to you one book to best understand this disease, I'll Quit Tomorrow is the one. And I try to get them to keep this on, on hand at Walden Books because every patient I have I refer to to buy this book. About that thick. Vern, Vern Johnson is a, uh, a doctor of theology and a recovered alcoholic. And he, in struggling to recover himself, began to get into the study of the disease and later developed uh, a nonprofit training center called Johnson Institute, Minneapolis, Minnesota. In any event, one of the things that they found in studying the disease is that sociopaths don't become chemically dependent. Sociopaths don't chem become chemically dependent. Why? They don't have any values to violate. I don't have a conscience. It doesn't matter to me what I do when I get drunk. Now, I can get physiologically addicted. And, you know, if you take me in a room and shoot me up with heroin every four hours, you know, in a, in a, in a short period of time, I'm going to be physiologically addicted, but also uh, you can clear my system out and I'll go right on my way. And uh, remember, the sociopath, yes, sir. I, I mean, don't you, sir, I just want to ask, is, is as part of this uh, emotional pain, this harmful dependency stage, would, would any of that be guilt, or is this non-existent at this point, as far as they're dealing with their uh, drugs? I didn't, I didn't, I didn't. Like, I'm asking if, if guilt is part of that emotional Oh, sure. Pain. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You betcha. Guilt definitely is. Uh, uh, otherwise, I wouldn't care about violating. I start, I start simply start doing things that are to me unacceptable in terms of my values. Now, at this time, one of the psych's defense mechanisms quickly runs in and starts working. Now, you know, all of us have psychological defense mechanisms. Everybody does, and and what these defense mechanisms do is they protect me from constant psychological bruising. You know, the simple fact is life ain't very fair. You know, and I get bounced around a lot. And what happens with a chemically dependent person at this point is a rationalization system starts to creep in. And we say of the chemically dependent person, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but we say that his defense mechanisms become uh, locked in, and they become very destructive to him. What is originally part of the human psyche that is that part of us that protects the ego later comes to start destroying it. But I'll get it. Uh, I don't want to get too far into that now. But one of the things that he starts doing is he starts a spontaneous rationalization to hide these feelings from me as the, the user. And in other words, I can't stand what I've done. And my rationalization system starts giving me reasons for it. It really wasn't so bad. Besides which, it's understandable how you got drunk. You hadn't eaten. That was the problem. Just hadn't eaten anything. Oh, you knew those people shouldn't be shoving those drinks. And didn't they have better sense? That little system of rationalization just spontaneously starts arising to excuse my behavior. That's what a rationalization is anyway. It's, just, it's, it's a way I protect myself from being wounded by the dumb things I do. We all do dumb things. And, and we rationalize. See? Okay. Now, my, I begin to have a lot of negative feelings about me, but they're, but they're non-generalized. I really can't put my finger on what's going wrong except I'm starting not to feel too good about me. See? As I, remember now, this is a, a progressive thing that's happening to me. See? It's not happening overnight. 
people don't become chemically dependent overnight. Uh, but the defenses, I mean, my feelings about myself are really the negative, and I and I don't under, I can't identify what they are, and they don't they aren't is a result resolvable for me. And this is why I start having a sort of a chronic emotional distress. Things aren't right. I'm doing things that aren't right for me. <coughs> so I start suffering some emotional pain. So that I go up to euphoria, and I don't drop back to normal when the drug's gone out of my body. I drop down in emotional pain. Okay? When you refer to emotional pain, what are you referring to? A general feeling of unease about me. I'm beginning to have negative feelings about me rather than positive feelings. I begin to think that there's something wrong with me, but I don't know what it is. You know? And, and so the way I view myself and the world around me is, is, is starting to get distorted, and I'm starting to dislike me. See? That's my emotional distress. It's really undifferentiated at that time. We don't have a clue as to what's happening to us. Now, I'm going to talk about delusions that, that chemically dependent people have at uh, it, it, it a little greater length in the second and third hour. But at this point, suffice to say that the alcoholic or the other chemically dependent person really doesn't know what's happening to them there. All he knows is that what used to be fun is not as much fun as it used to be. He still goes up to here. Because remember, the drug always works. Take enough, it'll always work. Now, another, another thing that's happening to me at this harmful dependence stage as I slip over into dependence is where I used to could only drink two or three drinks. Hey, I can drink a lot more now. A lot more. My tolerance starts growing in leaps and bounds. And the tolerance will grow to an astounding degree. The 25 or 30 Lamotal that the man, man took, you know, are people that routinely, routinely drink a fifth of whiskey a day. Yes, sir. Psychiatrist asked this patient back in Texas where I was, how much do you drink a day? And he hesitated and finally said, well, do you drink a fifth a day? He said, hell, doc, I spill more than that. <laughs> right. Yeah, the tolerance, the tolerance really grows. And you know, it's it. Uh, if I if I begin seeing a person that's on street drugs, you know, on heroin, and they say, I'll say, well, what's it costing you a day? Oh, seventy five dollars. They ain't really hooked yet. They're hooked, but I mean, you know, the more likely figure in this area is three hundred dollars a day. Have it. It's a lot of heroin, even you know, as expensive as it, as it is. So the tolerance grows and grows and grows. Now another thing that starts happening, and you'll see this if you're alert to people that you know that drink that are heading toward addiction. There's a growing anticipation of when it is I can use my drug. There's a growing preoccupation with the use of my drug. There's a growing rigidity as to when I will use and how I'll use my drug. My lifestyle will begin to change and to revolve literally around my drug and when I can use it. Now, that may sound incredible to you if you've never been around chemically dependent people. But the rigidity about when they'll use their drug is absolutely incredible. An alcoholic, for example, will not go eat where they don't serve alcohol to a restaurant. Not only that, his social contacts start reducing themselves down so that he won't even go see people or teetotalers. You don't spend an evening without drinking. Are you mad? You know? Uh, and, and the self-imposed rules that he developed in the second stage 
kind of go out to wonder, and he'll say, heck, it's five o'clock in the world somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if he were a person that never drank except in the evenings, then on Saturdays he'll start drinking at noon. Say, hey, it's Saturday's my day off. I deserve it. Got a rough week. Yeah. What about alcoholics that are still active in the church? They'll stop coming. They'll stop coming eventually. We'll talk about that and why in a little bit. But you're right. Yeah, we're right. They can't get that far away from the drink. They can't get up that far away from the drink, Pastor, but they also start to get pretty afraid of God. Uh, I, that's one of the predictable things that, that starts happening if the person is, is a church person and is very active in the church. I have a, a patient, uh, the wife of an alcoholic from a small town around here, who all of his life has been a, an active member in his church. As his, wife, as his wife, she's a lovely lady. They've both been very strong first members. And she said to me the last, one of the first times that I saw her in therapy, she said, uh, and gave her husband's name. He won't go to church with me anymore. And he's always got these reasons why he won't go now. And, and part of it is like you say, he didn't want to be away from it, but that's pretty far down. But earlier than that, uh, you know, I'm violating my values, remember. I'm doing things that are wrong for me, and if I'm a church person, that means God's laws I'm violating. But you know, even if I'm a even if I'm an atheist or an agnostic, this same process starts to happen because I'm violating what's right and wrong for me. See, now, I'm going to talk a lot about spiritual recovery in this disease later on. But the the, the simple fact is that I'm going into this uh, tolerance, this this preoccupation with the with the, with the drug. And another defense mechanism is starting to happen. Remember I said rationalization. The second big defense mechanism that all chemically dependent people employ, and these defense mechanisms incidentally are subconsciously used, is projection. My feelings of hatred for me are projected onto you, and you become the heavy. See? You become the heavy. The person that I picked up and took home last night uh, is in a stage where her projections are on the man to whom she's married. You know, and and the guy's not you know one of your more sterling husbands. No, no question about that. But her delusional system is such that she can't really identify where where her hatred is coming from and her anger. And when she reaches a point where I think she'll start really making some progress in recovery is when she starts identifying that that real anger and hatred that she feels is in here, toward here, toward me. Okay. And also, is, as this stage progresses, uh, the whole life of the chemically dependent person is beginning to deteriorate. Their, their physical health is starting to go. Uh, in the case of alcoholics, uh, for all of the calories they take in, they're always, almost always suffering from malnutrition because they're empty calories. A lot of calories in alcohol, but they don't do the body any good. Uh, one, uh, one of the things that happens with alcohol, for example, is it causes the body to, to deplete large amounts of vitamin B12. And uh, alcohol is, is without doubt. And, 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 Please take this away with you. The most dangerous drug in the world is alcohol. Period, underline, exclamation point. For what reason? Okay. It affects every single cell in the body when it goes in. It goes to every single cell in the body, and it does it very rapidly. Large amounts of it will affect, affect every major organ system in the body. The liver is one we know about, you know. The pancreas, uh, it causes uh, problems with the heart. Uh, it doesn't do very much to the kidneys because the kidneys are pretty sturdy. 
but it affects virtually the whole physical man. It also kills brain uh, cells every time we take a drink, but we've got billions of them, you know. And I used to have a, a friend that figured out how many he lost a day, <laughs> literally. Drunks are weird people, i got to tell you. <laughs> very strange people. But he figured out, he's, and his daughter was always telling him, Daddy, you know, he was a very intelligent man and, and a, 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 vice, a president of a, a large corporation, and he, his daughter would really get on to him about his drinking, and, and, he's, and he'd, he'd, he'd tell her every day, he'd say, I only took yeah, 2,000 today or 5,000, and I got 18 billion estimated or what have you. Come in. Good morning. I'm Joe Hurt. Hi. Are, are you a chaplain? Or? Yes, I'm a professor. Good. Okay. Good to have you with us. Okay. The spirituality uh, is just getting further removed from him, and I'm going to differentiate what I mean by spirituality versus religion later on. But spiritually, the person is become becoming more and more detached, and. His emotional stability is getting really bad, and his interpersonal relationships are really becoming adversely affected. He's not getting along with anybody. Yeah. Uh, as I progress in alcoholism, my circle of friends begins to change. <coughs> okay. Not only will I not associate with non-drinkers to any large degree, I won't associate with people that don't drink like I do, because they make me very uncomfortable. Now, I neglected to say something that I should have said right early on. Alcoholism is a primary, a primary disease. What does that mean? Anybody that got a feel for the term primary as it's used in medicine? If I have five major problems, yes? then there are secondary diseases that may result from the alcoholism. Right, or they may not. But if chemical dependency is one of my diseases, it's primary. I can have any number of very serious problems to include psychosis, schizophrenia, or, or another type of, any other type of psychosis. But if alcoholism or chemical dependency is one of them, it's primary, and I've got to deal with that before I can deal with any of the rest of them. And this vastly complicates the identification and treatment of the, the fact that uh, chemical dependency is a primary disease. Now, that's an important concept, and it's the reason why chemically dependent people do not get treated soon enough all too often. If a person shows up at the emergency room at Cape Fear Valley Hospital, let's say, I have a patient, for example, that we first came in contact with him. He had a gunshot wound to the neck. And, and the way that the psychiatrist with whom I'm associated and at whose clinic I work at the present time got into the picture anyway is that the guy was not making a lot of sense. You know? The reason why it wasn't making a lot of sense was that he was psychotic, chemically, he was in a chemically induced psychosis, which meant he'd lost total contact with reality. Well, I'll just throw it in. It's just starting to crank back up. Right. Just didn't want to ruin it. No, no problem. Uh, so that what was presented to the doctors that saw this man was a man that was totally out of touch with reality. He looked like a psychotic. Okay? Now, it's a matter of no surprise to anyone that persons that are chemically dependent present all sorts of problems. Uh, they tend to be very passive-aggressive people. They tend to, tend to be passive-dependent people, which are personality disorders. They tend to be filled with anxiety a generalized free-floating free anxiety, and without any doubt, they're depressed. See? 
These are genuine problems, but if you try to treat these symptoms, you know, and don't look at the chemical dependency, you're not ever going to make any progress. Because chemical dependency is the primary disease. Okay. We'll, we'll talk about that, and we'll see, I think, how uh, important that concept is a little later on. Okay, it's progressive. That means that it always gets worse. No? As we've gone through these stages down through here, what we've seen is a progressive use of a chemical. And remember, it doesn't matter what the chemical is. These steps, these progressive steps, take place no matter what my chemical happens to be. So it always gets worse. It's chronic. Chronic. Now, it goes into acute phases, you know, if I'm uh, having a, uh, an acute overdose of heroin or I've, I've gone into a hospital because I've got to be detoxified from alcohol and, uh, and, and I can't take any more, I'm so toxic, and you've got to, to bring me down and detoxify me, that's an acute stage, but the disease is chronic. Not only is it chronic, it's incurable. It's an incurable disease. Underline that. Chemical dependency is an incurable disease. I come from a line of people that have very long longevity. You know, I hope to live to be 100. But when they close my coffin on my remains, I will still be an alcoholic. By the grace of God, I may not die drunk. But I will be an alcoholic. There's no such state as alcoholism. Okay? And any idea that I can go back and learn to drink like a gentleman, forget it. Once a person is chemically dependent, that's it. Not only can I not use alcohol, I can't use any drug that affects my central nervous system, including that lovely drug, uh, uh, Parapon Forte, that would certainly help my chronic low back problems. It is invariably fatal. Untreated chemical dependency is invariably 100% fatal. And how do you suppose most people die from this disease? Anybody? By their own hand. Suicide. Okay. Primary, progressive, chronic, and fatal. H-R-O-N, I see that just somehow doesn't look right. By their own hand. That's because of them faking the chemicals themselves, right? Or you mean active suicide? Active suicide. Okay. Active suicide. Active suicide. You said something earlier about, you know, harmful that leads to the stage where it doesn't affect them like it used to, you know. Uh, is there any way that they say, well, you know, this isn't working, so they can back out, you know, start, or do they say, well, I need more and more and more, you know, because it's not doing it? More and more and more. They don't more and more and more. If I can reach the point where I say, hey, this stuff is really messing my life up, I'm not going to do it anymore, and stop, I'm not chemically dependent. More than likely, when they get to the stage where they are uh, harmful dependency, they're not going to start saying, well, this didn't give me the, what I want. They're not going to start saying, well, I need to get my life together. They're going to start more and more. Well, you'll have feelings, you know, you'll have the, the poor wretch that will say, wow, i got to do something. But when I start into the delusional memory system and the delusional system, emotionally and mentally, that the chemically dependent person goes in, you'll see why it doesn't work. You see why it doesn't work for it. Okay. Now, we were, I, I got off on this. Okay. No, no, no. I'd say that that's probably the most common way 
and, and, and it's mass, of course, for a lot of reasons. First of all, uh, you know, when a person's brought into a hospital and he's he's been drinking and, and he's also taken a handful of, of let's say, or oh, my brother died by his own hand with alcohol in a very few uh, of, 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 uh, f of a drug called Benadryl, most of us to me, well, that's uh, um, a decongestant and a histamine. Uh, and the reason why I know that he took his own life is that that was his seventh attempt. You know, but when if you'd have pleased him up, you know, and done an autopsy, he had alcohol and Benadryl, accidental. This is the way it would have been. But I knew. I held him in his arm in my arms. Cut his wrist. So, you know, it's often mass or uh, hard to protect the family. We'll talk about that aspect of it, Pastor, a little bit longer. But, but, but the important thing is it's invariably 100% failing. You know, you, you say, well, look, I know 80-year-old alcoholics. That's true. That's true. You do. Everybody does. You know, you say, well, how does it kill him? Well, uh, the, the latest figures that I saw was that, that, you know, the very least that happens on a heavy drinker, and remember, this is a progressive reason with disease, and we don't all progress at the same rate, okay? Uh, you know, I have a 21-year-old friend that's where I was at 38, you know? It doesn't mean that uh, I was a lot better than he. Uh, I just progressed one way, he progressed another. Uh, but usually they, uh, the, the, uh, I was reading an article by a doctor, and I don't know where he got his figures uh, for who the person who it. But he said that the, 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 the figure that they were arriving at now, AMA, was that it took 14 years off of your life if you were an active alcoholic. Uh, but that's, I, you know, I'm a little doubtful about that figure, not because it doesn't make sense, but because usually it, when you go into the later stages of this disease, Boy, the deterioration is so fast, you know, and, and the, the, the organ systems start getting so dysfunctional that usually, you know, a person's not going to make it into his 80s, and those are the exceptions, you know. You know, the average uh, lifespan in, in biblical times is what, 28 or 30? But we, we, we know that they speak of people that were in great, you know, had great advanced age, so those figures are a little misleading at times probably, but, but as to it being fatal, I have no doubt whatsoever. Now, when I go into the fourth stage, I start using my chemical not for its euphoric value. I start drinking to feel normal. Hey, listen, I can't get through the day without drinking. Now, I know people who routinely drink that fifth a day and and produce, you know, they're productive people. They're drinking to feel normal. Now, what does that mean, really? Okay, a lot of things just start happening. Up here in this stage, I start having uh, a thing happen to me that medically is called chemically induced amnesia. The term we use in my field is blackout. Start having blackouts. Okay. Let me tell you something. Blackouts are terrifying. A blackout is not passing out. A blackout is where I'm functioning, you know, to all outward appearances as if I've got everything together, but I don't remember anything. Total amnesia. Now, now, there are recorded cases of airline pilots taking off from point A and flying to point B, making all of the right moves and doing everything they're supposed to do in a total alcoholic blackout. Vern Johnson talks about surgeons who perform complicated surgery while in an alcoholic blackout. This may not frighten you, it scares me to death. Because the blackout doesn't mean that I'm uh, drunk. You know, in the sense that I'm staggering around, it just means that my memory, I mean, my uh, my remembrance of what's going on doesn't doesn't register. And so the next day, I don't know what's happening. You know. uh, Vern, in his book, quotes uh, talks talks about a man that came in to see him, and he said, 
He's an old friend, and, and he said, Vern, I'm terrified. What's the matter? Well, uh, 